Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Arthur N. Root Great Debate on the question, Taming Titans, How Should We Regulate Big Tech? My name is Susan Derwin, and I am the director of UC Santa Barbara's Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. On behalf of the IHC and tonight's co-sponsor, the College of Letters and Science, it's my pleasure to welcome each of you to the virtual IHC. I'd like now to introduce the Executive Dean of the College of Letters and Science, Pierre Viltzius. Well, thank you, Susan, and um, good afternoon, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Pierre Wiltzius. I'm the Executive Dean of the College of Letters and Science here at UC Santa Barbara. And it is wonderful to see the great interest in this uh, group debate uh, by the number of participants that we see already. But before we begin the debate, I want to take a moment to offer our heartfelt thanks to the Roop Foundation and particularly Arthur Roop for starting this event and generously supporting it. Arthur's vision was to bring great minds together at UCSB to discuss the most pressing issues of our time. And as a result, we have hosted some very lively debates over the past 20 years. Today's event promises to yield yet another exciting and informative discussion. So without further ado, I will turn it back over to Susan to introduce our panel. Thank you, Dean Viltzius. The Arthur N. Roop Great Debate Series was inaugurated at UC Santa Barbara in 2001 to carry out Arthur Roop's mission to, pr to provide a forum in which contemporary issues of national and international significance could be rigorously addressed through multiple perspectives and points of view. As Dean Vilti has said, we owe a debt of gratitude to Arthur Roop and his foundation for enabling us to engage the most learned minds of the day to critically discuss societal questions and challenges of pressing concern. The stakes of this year's debate topic are high. The big five tech companies are deeply intertwined in all of our lives. And we hope that tonight's event will advance our understanding of their impact on our private lives and on public discourse and enable us to grasp the key issues around questions of regulation. Before I introduce our interlocutors, I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the IHC is located. And I would also like to pay respect to elders, both past and present. It's my pleasure now to introduce the four legal experts here to engage with one another in discussion. Sonia Katyal holds the distinguished, distinguished Haas Chair at UC Berkeley School of Law and is co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. Her work focuses on the intersection of technology, intellectual property, and civil rights, including anti-discrimination, privacy, and freedom of speech. Kate Klonick teaches at St. John's University School of Law and is an affiliate fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. Her current research focuses on the development of Facebook's new Oversight Board, an independent body that hears appeals on content from Facebook users and advises the platform about its online speech policies. Randall C. Picker is the James Parker Hall Distinguished, Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. His primary areas of interest are the laws relating to intellectual property, competition policy and regulated industries, and applications of game theory and agent-based computer simulations to the law. The debate will be moderated by Michael J. Burstein, a vice dean and professor of law at Cardoza Law. Professor Burstein's research focuses on the ways in which intellectual property law, corporate law, and public law facilitate relationships among entrepreneurs, markets, and government actors, and influence the production and dissemination of innovative works and ideas. Thank you all for agreeing to take part in tonight's event. Before we begin, I want to tell our audience that at the end of the debate, we will spend 15 minutes answering your questions. At any time during the event, you can use the Q&A feature on your screen to submit your questions. This event is being recorded and will be available on the IHC website 
in two weeks. And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Michael Burstein. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Derwin. Uh, many thanks to UC Santa Barbara, to its Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, uh, to the Arthur Roop Foundation, and to all of you for joining us for the debate this evening. Big tech firms, uh, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, and a handful of similar companies are enormous presences in all of our lives. They are what we use to find out information about the world, to communicate with each other, to entertain ourselves, to purchase all the necessities of life. As they say in the comic books, with great power comes great responsibility, but it's unclear how much these companies take responsibility for their effects in the world, for giving megaphones to sources of misinformation and hate speech, for consolidating and controlling large parts of industry to the exclusion of competitors, and for accumulating enormous amounts of personal data and using it for a variety of purposes, often without users understanding or consent. So regulating big tech has become a rallying cry on both sides of the aisle. In this panel discussion, we're going to break down what regulating big tech means. The first step in deciding whether something needs to be regulated, of course, is to ask, is there harm that we ought to prevent or is there a benefit that we ought to secure? Once this is identified, the conversation shifts to how to prevent that harm or to secure that benefit. On one end of the spectrum is the principle that market forces left alone will achieve good outcomes. On the other end is the idea that only the government can act with all of the relevant costs and benefits in mind. And of course, in the middle is the mix of private and public action that characterizes most of the American economy. Today's tech giants grew and thrived in an environment marked by relatively little regulation, but times change and that position may be increasingly difficult to maintain. In this afternoon's debate, we'll talk about three key areas, free speech, antitrust, and privacy. In each of these areas, the central question is whether big tech can regulate itself or whether and how the government should step in with more particular rules of the road. But to start the conversation, I'd like to ask each of our panelists a somewhat more fundamental question. Why should people care about regulating big tech? We'll start with Professor Klonick. It's only been a year and a half and I still haven't gotten the hang of that. Um, thank you so much, Mike. And thank you to the Arthur Roop um, Foundation for uh, this incredible opportunity to speak to such distinguished minds about such an important topic. I am very excited to be here. The rallying cry that Mike speaks of about rallying big tech is not only a deceptive oversimplification of how tech is in our lives and how we want to control it. But a harmful oversimplification that threatens to use the precision of a hammer where we want the precision of a scalpel. And so I'm going to just take, for example, the four in the in the in the in the interest of being argumentatively and funly debated debating this civilly, um, I'm going to say the four companies just mentioned: Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google all do vastly different things and thus imply vastly different regulatory mechanisms. Amazon is a marketplace for consumers, but it is also a mall with venues for third party sellers. And it is a web server prop up for large swaths of the internet that go mostly invisible to the average individual. Apple captures users by acclimating them to software that it sells through its hardware and its app service provider that shuts off other types of interest from IP um, competition. Google, also known as Alphabet, is actually a vast network of things from speech, which is YouTube, to indexing, which is search to basic everyday connectivity, which is Drive, Docs, Gmail, Calendar, and then even to science, 
and social science, which is Jigsaw, all of which alone provide valuable services, but together are one of the most powerful companies that the world has ever seen. And Facebook is a speech company and an associational company and a news company that we have never seen the likes of before. And so each of these definitions could go far more in depth. I could drill into Oculus on the Facebook side, right? Like that's not, that's different than everything we talked about. I could drill into WhatsApp on the Facebook side. That's different than everything we've talked about. But this is the cursory leveling that I think we can see regulating big tech is a facile statement and one that must be complicated before any real work is done to try to figure out how best to attack the various things that we intuitively feel compelled by and out of control with in any one of these platforms. Terrific. Thank you so much, Kate. Professor Picker. Uh, thank you very much. So, so I agree with Kate that these companies are interestingly different, and I, I do think people sometimes lump them together, and I think that's a mistake. I guess to go back to Mike to the to the question you posed, why should we care? Um, it's because of the role these firms play in our lives. So, um, you know, when I wake up in the morning, uh, before I get out of bed, I have within arm's reach my iPad. <laughs> Um, and the first thing I do is, is I look at Twitter. And what am I looking at Twitter for? What happened in Europe seven hours ago? That's what I'm looking at. So uh, what did I learn this morning? Well, I followed the German competition authority, the Bundeskartellmont, as we put it. Um, and they issued a, a new inquiry into Amazon this morning. Germany, in some sense, we're gonna talk about what type of regulation might work here. We've got antitrust on the one hand, Europe, I think, is starting to move beyond antitrust to more public utilities style regulation. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about that. There's something called the Did Draft Digital Markets Act that they're looking at. But Germany's already done a version of that. So Germany is in some sense living in that future now. And today they announced uh, an inquiry with regard to Amazon. They've got one of those pending with regard to Facebook. I wanna see both pieces of that. Um, I, I'm a, I think there is something wonderful, I'll say about Honestly, most of these companies, I'm not a huge Facebook fan. We can have that conversation. Maybe that says something about me. You know, maybe I'm just not that social at the end of the day. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I regard Apple devices as, as sort of a beautiful experience. I can't imagine life without Google search. Um, and Amazon delivers packages to my house with shocking frequency. Though I did get a package today from this other small company you may have heard of that would be Walmart. So part of what's also interesting here is, is to try to understand why these companies have captured the attention that they have, right? Walmart's much bigger than Amazon. Amazon's really growing. So absolutely that. And they're a much broader, more interesting company in some sense, uh, but they're still a, a smaller company than Walmart. And many of the practices that they engage in of selling their own products, uh, companies have been selling their own products for a long time, Sears, moved into their own products in like 1927 or something like that. But if you ask why these companies matter, it's because of the central role they play in our lives. If you look at the big tech cases in the United States and the antitrust in the past, IBM in 1969, uh, 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 Microsoft in 1998, AT&T in 1947, and then again in 1974, only AT&T was a company that Bell that everyone cared about. Most people never seen uh, an IBM mainframe. And while PCs mattered, they really mattered to a narrow group. All right, I've got five seconds. That's why I think those companies matter and why we should care about how we regulate them. Thank you so much, Randy. Professor Kabyal. Great, uh, thanks so much. It's such a pleasure to be here and, uh, and also just to share the Zoom screen with such incredible minds, people I admire so much. Um, and I just really want to thank the Roop Foundation, uh, UCSB, for um, putting this together and inviting us all um, to be here uh, to really address, which I think is one of the big central issues. Um, and I will say, I, you know, I agree with both Kate and Randy, but um, I, I do want to kind of just take a step back and ask the broader question about kind of not how we regulate, but why we should care about regulating big tech. And, um, and I wanna just suggest that this is the 
defining civil rights issue, I think, of our time, right? Um, and, and so the first reason that we should care about regulating big tech is because what we've seen over the years is that the government has in many ways, large and small, kind of ceded the growth and responsibility of innovation to private companies. And, you know, at first glance, uh, many of us might think that this is a really good thing because uh, many of us also grew up in the percentage in the, the time period where I think we were very skeptical of regulation when the internet kind of first was on the horizon. There was a perception, I think, promulgated by, you know, the leaders in our field, Larry Lessig among them, um, uh, that over-regulation stifles creativity, um, particularly in the early days of the internet. But that is actually, I think, in many ways, no longer the case, uh, at least in the areas that we're thinking about, right? So now a small number, just as uh, Randy pointed out, a small number of private companies have enormous power over your daily lives, pushing and nudging you to determine what you purchase, who you go out with, who your friends are, what information you share with them, and ultimately, uh, who you vote for and, and why. And the rise of this power, I think, by private companies, I think has in some small part or large part been fueled by under-regulation. And I think we're also at the flip side of that, where we see that this lack of regulation has had dire consequences for things like privacy, freedom of speech, and competition, just as um, Michael point, points out. Um, as government regulation, I think, has not expanded over technology, technology has grown so quickly, which is a great thing, um, but also in the absence of that regulation, private companies are now increasingly playing the same role that government used to play, helping to automate decisions in government, and so on. Now, why is this a problem? Well, I think it's a problem because of uh, a very foundational concept, I think, that brings all four of us together, right? Which is that our nation, the reason that we probably all thought about going to law school, right, and studied constitutional law was because it's founded on the idea of holding government accountable, but we failed to ask the same of private companies. So, personals per, so people's personal data is not nearly as private as, as it should be. This is tied to the lack of regulation. People are less safe than they should be on social media, and that's tied to the lack of moderation of content. People aren't being told the truth, and this is also due to a lack of oversight. And people have less choices. And this, I think, is also due to a lack of regulation. And this, I think, kind of implicates everything and magnifies the concerns that I've raised about privacy, freedom of speech, due process, and consolidation. So I think we need to think about regulating big tech because in many ways, the future of our civil rights is at stake. Thank you so much, Sonia. So a few moments ago, Kate referred to Facebook as a speech company. Um, and so that's where we'll begin. Uh, tonight's debate. Um, Facebook reaches billions of people around the world. Uh, it functions as a critical forum for speech, but it's also, you know, as Sonia so eloquently pointed out, a private company that has the ability to moderate speech that takes place in its community. Facebook's content moderation decisions are now subject to review by a new oversight board, uh, an independent group of academics, free speech experts, uh, other advocates. In its highest profile decision to date, the board ruled a couple of weeks ago that Facebook could restrict former President Donald Trump from posting because his posts repeatedly violated Facebook's standards for truthful election information. The board has critics on both sides. Some think it goes too far to censor free speech. Others think that it won't effectively curb the spread of misinformation around the world. And so the question is, uh, can big tech companies effectively regulate themselves when it comes to free speech? Or do we need new laws to establish standards for online speech? And Kate, why don't you kick us off uh, with respect to this question? Yes, of course. And I want to respond in brief to Sonia's call to action about civil rights, which I couldn't agree more with. Um, and I want to point out the fact that there are protesters in Hong Kong and there are protesters in India and there are protesters in Brazil that are completely dependent on 
big tech, as we call it, in order to get their message out and to organize now in a way that was never possible before um, in a free and kind of in this in um, in what tech can give you type of economy. And so I, I want to just like stage that because I think it is a very important balance in all of the harms that tech does create and trust me i understand them at a very personal level like from being harassed and like everything else online um having worked in this space for like the last 10 years um that i'm not i'm not saying that those are small things but there are wonderful things that tech does for pro-democracy movements and for people that are living under autocratic regimes and so i want to kind of put that out there Speaking directly to your question though, Mike, the oversight board is a robust new form, basically, of self-regulation that is coming out of that is coming out of Facebook. It is self-regulation because no one is making them do this. This is a thing they've taken on themselves. And it is an incredibly intricate, it is like an incredibly intricate top to like a very flawed already system of, of governance over speech that Facebook has in place. And it's an attempt to answer critics and stakeholders that have hit at them for years to regulate and create more procedure transparency and rule of law around how this private company company, Facebook, polices the transnational right of freedom of expression. And in this regard, it's both the bold divestment of power from Facebook, a private company, but it can be also like reinforced through regulation and governments could require in the future such independent tribunals to exist to adjudicate account bans, content takedowns, or failure to take down at scale. And I think this would actually be a very powerful step towards a procedural mechanism to meet this this demand rather than substantively reaching like the speech decisions that it would almost be like an, a Chevron level of deference mm -hmm. to various types of Facebook decisions around speech. Um, and I'm out of time, sorry. Thanks, Kate. Randy. Uh, thanks, so so I guess I wanna say a couple things about um, Facebook and the, the oversight board. So I, I teach the law school, but I also teach a class at our business school. And I've taught actually the governance board there because I think it's really an interesting exercise in sort of corporate governance that, you know, is a first step. Uh, this is a private entity that's trying to figure out exactly how to allocate the power that it has as a private firm internally. And what I think is interesting about that is, is, you know, two things, I guess. One, is that really clever by Facebook? They sort of outsource some hard decisions. They don't face as much direct pressure. Look, they made us do it. Um, and so it's, it's a way to manage a problem uh, in a way that might be fairly clever uh, as, a, as a private for-profit entity. Okay, that's one possibility. Different possibility, I'm interested to hear the discussion on this, is whether it's actually a good moderation tool, right? That's, that's sort of ultimately the question, which is, how do we achieve the moderation we want, assuming we want that at scale? And obviously one of the things that you see in the conflict between Democrats and Republicans over Facebook is their disagreements as to what should be done, right? On the one hand, one group wants to say, look at all this terrible speech on Facebook, we need to stop it. A lot of good speech, as Kate was saying, very powerful, right? Uh, uh, Zainab Trufeki has books on Twitter and, and revolutions and the power of all that right, really valuable. At the same time, you've got another group saying they're blocking speech, they shouldn't do that, right? When I teach, I teach a course on some of these issues and I start with the history of the post office, right? And the post office was a common carrier. That's a phrase you're gonna start to hear more of. And a common carrier sort of takes all comers, right? They have to, they don't get to say, oh, I don't like this. I don't like your letter, it's not coming in. Oh, that's a bad idea, I'm not gonna mail that letter. And the question I think is, and I'm almost out of time, is whether we want whether we want to bring that kind of regime, a no moderation regime, to Facebook. Thank you, Randy. Sonia. Hi. Thanks. Um, so, so I'm going to take a, a step back and just ask this larger question about kind of trust, right? Um, do we do we actually trust big tech to regulate itself? Um, and here I would say, you know, I've, I've got kind of a mixed point of view about this. I mean, we, you know, there is this oversight board. Um, I think Kate's work on this has been fantastic, right? Which is composed of sort of 
independent thinkers, experts, leaders for the for this for this very small number of tough cases um, that we're going to actually see in the media and that the oversight board is going to be um, prepared to promulgate. Um, and I guess I would say, you know, I do think that that is a step forward um, from a, a corporate governance perspective. And I really, you know, loved what Aunt Randy just said about that kind of thinking about it as an experiment of corporate governance. But I also just want to kind of step back and point out that I think we're at this point because the rules that govern social media were, I think, you know, really developed at a time where there was really less, I think, awareness of the potential for, for, for the misuse of social media, right? For the great harm and harassment that we see now, uh, the political manipulation, um, the mass commercialization, the kind of addiction issues that I think people have uh, faced on social media. And I think the larger issue um, that we're really grappling with is the way in which platforms amplify uh, the messaging on social media, right? Um, and that to me, I think is the biggest concern. Um, so all of these changes, I think really require us to be mindful of who's actually the most at harm, which is I think social media tends to target the most vulnerable in our society, women, LGBTQ individuals, and so on. So I would, when we think about how to regulate, I would recommend starting from that place, right? Thinking about who is the most targeted and then figure out ways to create a healthier space for social media. Um, and, you know, here I just, I know my time is up, but I'm just going to flag for you Kate's awesome article in the Harvard Law Review about new governors, which I think really makes the case that, you know, this is a new mode of governance and we don't have analogies that work as neatly, um, uh, despite the fact that we need them. Great. Thank you, Sonia. So let's have a few minutes of discussion amongst our panelists. Um, and maybe I'll start things out by asking, you know, all three of you touched a little bit on the relationship between private governance and public governance, between companies running themselves as they see fit and uh, governments, you know, structuring laws and regulations to achieve a public good. You know, maybe starting with Kate, could you say a little more? You used a term deference uh, at the end of your remarks. Um, to suggest that Facebook could be a model for what government agencies might do. Can you say a few more words about what that might look like? Yeah, I think that we are like, honestly, I think that we are in a mode of like, like in an Elix and a Bob Ellickson sense, like a, a, a mode of like strong, like norm adjustment, like in which we are going to have some some of our needs met by norms and some of them met by law and uh we are not going to be able to dictate which of those are but norms are going to adjust regardless and basically i feel that the that the, right now the the solutions that are being talked about to regulate big tech and to regulate specifically speech platforms would be really harmful to speech generally and transnationally. And by that, I mean, a place like Facebook has the most robust and most thoughtful, even though it is incredibly flawed, um, content moderation system in the world. They employ 30,000 human beings to review content that is being flagged every day and no one else is putting that type of time or money into this type of project. And if we broke up Facebook, for example, the way we broke up or kind of like, like disambiguated AOL, like I think that we would have a bunch of problems on our hands that we're not really actually wanting. Like, I think that that is not what we're, that when we say break up big tech or we say regulate big tech, I do not think that that's what we're talking about. Um, and I understand our impulses to take control, but the speech department is much, much different than all of these other types of public private distinct like disambiguities. And like, that's kind of what I'm trying to, to, to distinguish between. Randy or Sonia? Um, Sonia, you I, want to go? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I will. I mean, I, I, 
I, I agree with Kate. I, I mean, I think that what Kate points out is, is, is important, right? That we need to think more granularly about opportunities and, and, and obstacles to regulating speech. I just, let me just throw one more thing into the mix, which I think is um, just an important example of how over-regulating this space actually could cause significant problems. So a number of years ago, um, you know, one of the things that happened was uh, there was a law passed uh, with the goal in mind, um, it's uh, called uh, Sessa Fosta, the goal in mind of curbing sex trafficking, right? And, you know, in many ways, a laudable goal. Um, and it had the most severe unintended consequences. And one of the most unintended consequences of it was that um, it was interpreted so broadly by the platform uh, companies that it actually wound up having the effect of making sex workers more vulnerable, right? Because they could no longer use social media to assess uh, the safety of uh, the individuals that they were transacting with. And it actually did in fact lead to a higher incidences of crime against uh, prostitutes and individual sex workers. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important to note about this is that it also had a really deleterious effect on um, sexually oriented speech. So individuals uh, on dating sites uh, suddenly had their, you know, their conversation um, monitored and curbed in a way because of the overly broad interpretation of the risks of, of this law. And so my, the reason I bring this up is because like, again, regulation might be passed with the most, um, you know, consequences that I think, you know, might seem controversial, but the way in which these laws are interpreted wind up targeting those are, that are actually the most in need of protection. And that's why I think we need to be careful about how we regulate. I haven't met a sex worker, Sonia, or like someone who is in like the line of advocating for sex workers that has liked Sesta Fosta. And this was apparently a, like that was this apparently a regulation for them. And all of them feel completely like, and all of them, if you will talk to them, like also feel like they are banned from various other platforms like Venmo and PayPal. They can't get like accounts because of like various things like this. And like, this is actually, this is actually a very, like it sounds like, oh, it's just like a really small class of people, but no, this like actually extrapolates to like a lot of other types of people in a lot of other situations very quickly. Um, and I do think that like, that's a, that's a tremendous example. And that is an example, by the way, Sesta Fosta of section 230 reform, which we haven't talked about, but like, nor shall we, hopefully. But <laughs> like, that's... <laughs> well, and to, and to jump to a different group, but it's, it's the same kind of effects that Kate was just talking about. So obviously Parler got kicked off of Amazon Web Services and, and boom, all of a sudden their ability to communicate basically vanished overnight. And so the, the, these, these you know, gatekeepers, uh, platforms, um, they have a lot of power. Um, and, 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 and the law that we were just talking about is one that, look, maybe I'm naive. I think Congress passed that law with the best of intentions. I don't, I don't, uh, maybe you'll tell me, no, no, you're wrong. You don't get it. That's possible. But, but it, the truth of the matter is, is that actually building effective regulation is a very hard problem. Yes, that is. Could, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> sorry, I was just gonna say, could either Kate or Sonia or Randy say a few words for the audience about what SESTA FOSTA was and what it did? I can I can do that really quickly. So Section 230 was um, for for those that are unfamiliar, Section 230, which has been in the news a lot lately, was a law that was passed in 1985 that was part of the Communications Decency Act, which was passed because Congress <clears throat> at the time was very disturbed at the amount of pornography that was on the internet, and so they decided that they could not directly regulate pornography, and so they were going to regulate it through this kind of intermediary system of basically giving platforms immunity for from from tort liability for their uh, like for basically like being able to take down or keep up various types of information um and that got extremely um i guess telescoped 
over time with various doctrine and the court's interpretation of it. And so it has become a very broad kind of form of immunity for any type of tech company and anything that they do to have immunity against kind of like defamation or any type of other type of suit that would typically fall on a, on a, a publisher. Um, but Sesta Fosta in particular came out of a, a suit that uh, was around Section 230 called Backpage v. Doe that was basically saying that um, Backpage was like, I will call it evil Craigslist, uh, is was like, uh, was a form of basically like how you like how you would match with like sex workers and sex traffickers. And it was a very nefarious site known for a lot of illicit activity. And they were trying to take it down and like, Basically, it was blocked by Section 230 immunity. And then because of that, the Congress passed a, a specific type of uh, amendment to Section 230 to admit this type of activity into sec to like to, to accept section this type of activity into Section 230 immunity. Does that make sense? Sorry, that yeah, was too long. Thank you. No worries. Thank you so much, Kate. I hate to uh, I hate to cut this conversation short, but I'm afraid we do actually have to move on to uh, our next of three issues, uh, which is antitrust. And so to frame up the antitrust question, um, consider that antitrust law places limits on what firms with monopoly power, uh, companies that are big enough that they can effectively control the markets in which they operate, um, can do with that power. Specifically, it prevents companies with a monopoly from abusing that monopoly to keep out competitors or to harm consumers. Last year, the Department of Justice and 49 states sued Google for antitrust violations, alleging that the company used its dominant position as the internet's leading search engine and largest platform for advertising to exclude competitors. Similar claims can be made about Amazon's use of its dominant position in e-commerce to favor its own branded products, uh, or Apple's use of its app store to extract high fees from developers who want to sell their apps to iPhone users. So, the question here, and I think Randy will start with uh, with you for this one, is should antitrust law be used to break up these companies? So I'm going to say that's a really hard problem. So uh, I'll give a quick quick introduction to antitrust. Um, so United States antitrust law is a fault based system. You have to do something wrong. If you go out into the marketplace and compete and win, that's not an antitrust violation, right? That's competition on the merits. Um, and so it's only if we establish fault that we can do something. And then the question is, and that's sort of the breakup question, what do we do? So these companies, I do not think it would be straightforward to establish fault. I've been watching on Twitter the Apple Epic uh, trial, which is going on right now. Leah Nylon and others are doing a great job of watching the trial and actually tweeting it. It's not going to be straightforward to establish liability there. If you go back and watch, and if you haven't watched, you should go watch uh, the launch of the iPhone in 2007 and Steve Jobs there. He says, look, our goal is to get 1% in the next year of the telephone business. Apple had nothing. And Apple competed in this space and succeeded in the 30% fee that Epic doesn't like that emerges there. So figuring out fault is going to be hard. OK, then turn to breakups. Our last breakup was AT&T in 1984. AT&T agreed to that to get out from a prior agreement from 1956. We have not had a non-consensual, meaning we fought in the court system in one breakup of a large tech firm. And I, I couldn't tell you when. I don't think antitrust is your tool of choice if you want to break them up. I suspect you want to pass laws. <laughs> we did that with regard to banking in the 1920s with Glass-Steagall. Um, and uh, uh, that's the path here, if that's what you want to do. That's a democratic choice. We get to make choices in democracies. That's what we do. We have elections to do that. Um, and um, that's, a, I think, a faster path. The trial in the Google case, I'm out of time, I think are scheduled for 2022 and 2023. It's a slow process. Thank you, Randy. Sonia. Okay, so uh, so I gotta just say that um, I think Randy like is truly like the expert on, on on all matters antitrust, and I actually would like 
much rather hear from him as I, I think Kate and I both feel the same way. Um, but for the sake of uh, debate, I'm gonna I'm gonna try really hard to kind of take a slightly different approach um, and uh, and add and inject a little bit of distrust into the market uh, here and uh, and and point out that I think that it's not controversial to point out that I think that antitrust laws here in this space are not working as they should and I think that it requires us and this is this is my view I you know I don't know whether Randy agrees. Um, hopefully he doesn't for the sake of debate. Um, I think that we need to kind of rethink our, our approach. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually very excited to see uh, what the new administration is going to do with the stellar minds of Tim Wu and Lena Khan on board. Um, and so, so let me just throw out a couple of things that I'd be thinking about, right? Which is um, the first is really thinking about how to redefine and, and really renegotiate, or at least how how we could transform the notion of what it means to be anti-competitive. So here, we're not just thinking of the size of a company, but also the way in which that company has diversified its portfolio so it can engage in self-dealing, right? So you've got Amazon collecting all this data and then producing its own products. And thinking about how that affects the consumer, I think is really important. I would also try and force companies to work harder Right, as I think new legislation has proposed uh, that to, pr to prove that a merger is not necessarily gonna harm competition, right? So Facebook buys Instagram, uh, what are the effects on the market, right? Uh, new legislation actually lays out really specific parameters in deals of more than 5 billion or involving a company worth more than 100 million or resulting in, a, in one company uh, uh, gaining a market share of 50% or more, they have to prove, right, that um, it's not going to, it's not going to harm competition. And the last thing that I would say is, like, let's think big about enforcement here, right? Let's put some resources towards enforcement and really redefining what antitrust means in this new era. Thanks, Sonia. Kate. Yeah, um, I, I put in the chat to the panelists that I would gladly cede my time to Randy because he has so much more expertise in antitrust than I do. But I, um, I have read quite a few antitrust papers at this point, and that makes me a certified expert. So like, <laughs> let me just say, straighten my blouse and I'm ready to go. Uh, there is, I would say like, so I actually think that there is something very concrete to add to the antitrust conversation around platforms, which is that, so let's just take Facebook, for instance. How do you break up Facebook? What is it that bothers you about Facebook? Is it a, what is it about Facebook that it bought up all of these other entities? Like, is it that it bought up WhatsApp and that it bought up Instagram? No, that is not what bothers you about Facebook. What bothers you about Facebook is that it like has like a hive mind to your entire life and that it is in your entire like in that it's in your feed and that the product that is delivering you is this kind of see all thing that you cannot control okay and that is like garnering information from other types of areas in your life so this is something that i kind of want to get into the fact that this is not necessarily something that is well fixed by antitrust so not to date myself but I was a kid who grew up in AOL chat rooms and AOL being my main ISP and AOL being the way that be, being the internet, so to speak. And I was just talking about this with my partner the other day. He was like, no, I was a prodigy kid. And I was like, no, I wasn't like an AOL kid. But the idea was like the basically that like we both, I grew up in like these chat rooms and this AOL thing. And then it like ascended to Adium which was this open source, ICQ, multi-factor type of like, everyone could plug all of their chat like names into it type of program. And it was open source. And why did that happen? It happened because of the AOL Time Warner merger and the idea that AOL had to disaggregate its chat feature from AOL. And it turns out that no one wants to hang around freaking AOL looking at AOL news, if they're not chatting with their friends, they were only doing that because they wanted to see their friends. And so if you could disaggregate that, it killed the entire business model. And so this is like a little bit of like, 
did the death of AOL lead to MySpace lead to Facebook? Maybe, but like, this is just kind of like what I'm trying to say in the, ter in terms of like, when we decide to regulate these companies or bust them up, what we ready ourselves for is not necessarily what we think is going to be the logical conclusion. You know, there's a concept underlying, I think all three of your comments on this question, um, which is worth bringing to the surface a little bit. And, and the, the word that all three of you use to describe some of these companies is platform, right? So what is a platform and, and what makes it different? What makes it so that the choice whether to, you know, use traditional antitrust law, whether to use, you know, traditional kind of public utility regulation, like we applied to the post office or to telecom companies, you know, what's different about platforms that makes this choice more difficult and more complicated? Anyone? User, gener user generated content, generate like content that comes from users, content that doesn't come from third party, like from other sources like news. I mean, that isn't just, I mean, it could be like recapitulation of news sources through user generated content, but generally user generated content and the ability for users to directly publish onto a worldwide platform. I mean, that's gotta be too narrow, right? So, so in the sense that you wanna call the app store a platform, I take it, right? And so there's obviously developers there uh, no, I wouldn't okay. call. I wouldn't call. I wouldn't call the App Store a platform. But but okay. But so I, I think I'm, economists I'm would certainly your, call it a platform. Yes, I'm here. I'm happy to hear your argument for it. But I would. We can. Yeah. yeah. So 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 look. I, I we can now. I'm interested. I want to say because I I, I want to say that that the the you know the great revolution in in microeconomics during I don't know the 1990s was the emergence of two sided market analysis. That's a lot of fancy words. But those fancy words say that these are situations where someone's in the middle um, and people care about the presence of people on both sides of that thing in the middle. So the software developers from Microsoft care about the number of consumers and which platform they're going to they're going to produce on or they're going to be on Mac or Unix or, or Microsoft. They care about the number of, of potential customers and customers care about the number of developers. So I think that's a pretty conventional use of platforms and that would cover. No, I see what I see what you're saying. I would only argue that like I see it as less frictional. So I see it as like users being able to post with even less friction than they can have in something like an app store where there is a mod like the moderation is very obvious and but 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 microsoft again i think we would have thought as a platform and microsoft was not moderating software at all right it, it, anyone could write software to the windows platform yeah okay so what would it what would it mean to regulate these companies as you know using randy's phrase from the very start of our debate public utilities what does that mean and what would it look like can I can I actually add to that because I'm really yeah, interested please. in Randy's. Um, so Randy, like, can you tell me like what are the limits of the market here? Like, what would you what would you like? Let's say that you you know you're the new antitrust czar. Like, what are you looking at? You think common carrier is the way to go? Like, what would you like to see? Well, did you say the limits of the market share? Is that what you said? I'm just I didn't quite hear it. I I, I'm, I guess let me just rephrase this to ask a broader question, which okay. is uh, like. How do you view how antitrust can be applied to these kinds of situations? And would you would you change existing law, or, or would you offer a new framework? Okay, so so it, it it seems to me that the closest tool that we have in antitrust to something that looks like public utility style re regulation is something called the essential facilities doctrine. Now I just used a bunch of words that everyone dropped off on the participant list. I'm sure. And the essential facilities doctrine really goes back to the regulation of railroads in the 1910s and terminal railroad case and crossing the Mississippi River at St. Louis. That body of doctrine is underdeveloped. Um, and so if I were someone who wanted, if I were a private antitrust litigator, that's where I would go chase. But as a, as a social policy maker, if I put my hat on, I say, I don't know that antitrust is where I want to be. I said this earlier, I go to Congress. I'll, I'll stop. Great. Uh, 
so again, great discussion that I hate to move on from, but let's chat privacy uh, for a few minutes. Uh, so all of the major tech companies uh, collect data about our everyday lives, right? They store our photos, they track our locations, they facilitate our speech and communications. And many of them use this data about us as a source of revenue, right? They sell it to advertisers who use it to target their advertisements with precision. And although many of these companies claim to be transparent about how they use our data, their policies are buried in pages long terms of service that are difficult even for the four of us lawyers to make sense of. Uh, and although they claim to allow users some aspect of control over their information, those controls are buried in layers of hard to find settings. So Sonia, let me direct this question to you for the first swing. Uh, can big tech be trusted to look out for users' personal data, or do we need laws to limit what they can do with personal information? Yeah, so on this, uh, you know, I think I'm going to jump in wholeheartedly and say, yes, we, we clearly need uh, a better and more uh, privacy regulation. Um, I think there needs to actually also be uh, especially given uh, the news of the Supreme Court's um, recent decision uh, to take up a case involving uh, reproductive freedom, I think we actually have to do a sort of massive overhaul of the notion of privacy, right? Beyond just informational privacy and engage more deeply with the idea of privacy as a prism, right? Not just informational privacy, but lots of different kinds of interests, bodily privacy, informational privacy, autonomy, and so on. And so these are all things that do not at first glance relate to the world of big tech, but I, but I wanna put forward a proposition that I think we actually, you know, big tech needs to be connected to all of these different kinds of, of uh, prisms of privacy. And, um, and how can we do that effectively? Well, let me, let me just introduce an analogy or a comparison here, which is that in the EU, I, I think it is fair to say that there's a much more fundamental rights framework that governs privacy, right? Um, that it is viewed through the lens of human rights in many ways. And as a result, I think we have a more robust system that protects informational privacy. So you have the GDPR, things like accuracy, Port of data portability, the right to erase your data, um, requiring more transparency about data collection processes. These things are all protected. Um, and I think in the US, we have a more market-based system. And I think that's part of the problem. The lack of the regulation means that you don't have harmonized standards. And in a world where increasingly AI, uh, artificial intelligence is gonna drive regulation, this issue becomes an issue of, uh, of essentially data consolidation, right? Where a small number of companies have an enormous amount of data and they can deploy that data in ways that affect the rest of the world um, uh, in the absence of regulation. So uh, I know I've just painted a very pessimistic picture, but this is where I think the optimism of more privacy regulation is warranted. Thanks so much, Sonia. Kate. Sonia, that was awesome. And um, I rem it reminds me of, I was in a conversation with Nick Clegg, who is the head of policy at, uh, or former MP uh, um, at, in the UK, but like now the head of policy at Facebook. And he said to me, he was like, Kate, he was like, the EU just like doesn't trust markets and loves the government. And the United States, doesn't trust the government and loves the markets. <laughs> and like, I was like, <laughs> I was like, there you go. Uh, there's your problem. But I do think that that is actually like a huge, like, I think it actually like not to oversimplify it, it does paint the perfect picture of why it is that like the EU has been able to pass something like the omnibus um, privacy regulation of GDPR in like the last um, couple of years. Uh, I think this is like a huge point. I will just point out, and this is just for my personal research, um, and that I always feel like is really important to point out that before we had kind of privacy regulations in the space, there were a lot of big tech firms that were going to bat for individual citizens privacy rights in a way that was like kind of unthanked and unrecognized and also like is not necessarily going to keep happening so I don't want to like think that it's like 
like Google's doing the right thing or something. I'm saying they did the right thing a couple of times. And so like, let's just like acknowledge it. But this is like the idea that there were just like a number of times, like, and still to this day, like governments constantly petition these big tech platforms for the information that they're gathering on their citizens. And these big tech platforms have resisted like, or are resisting, I don't know what the current state of things are, but they have resisted in the past. And I think that this is like a very pure, like fourth amendment, first amendment type of like norm thinking from like the Silicon Valley people that are running this type of thing globally. But I do think that this is like a huge part of like something that we're not, what we're totally underestimating that has saved a lot of lives probably. And like a lot of private data like because these tech companies have decided to not just fold to like various governments and in fact agreed to like be turned off by these various governments if they decide not to agree to turn over certain types of certain types of data so i'm just trying to like kind of like paint the picture that this is not like government is not always a solution to all of these things sometimes the government is like the villain in these scenarios thanks so much kate randy so, you know, I think it's interesting to look a little bit at comparable situations from, from the past. So um, the 1996 Telecommunications Act, for example, obviously uh, massive telephone systems see a lot of information about their customers. They know who you're calling and the like, you know, how long you're on the phone and the like. And the 1996 Telecommunications Act had limitations on the extent to which those firms could use that information. Um, there were similar limitations in place with regard to credit cards. American Express knows more about me maybe than anyone on the planet. Um, and we limited the ability to use that information. The current tech firms sort of ran into open territory, unregulated territory, and said, we're going to do this. And at no point have we jumped in to do something about that. So it's not as if we don't have models from the past. We do. Again, it's sort of a question of the willingness to, to, to do something about it. Now, I want to go down two paths, and since I know less about privacy, now I can ask questions. So that's what I'm going to do. I want to see what Sonia wants to say here in just a second. So I'll go one path is sort of a little bit of a belief in markets. So what's happening with regard to iOS and 14.5, um, and now the fact that when Facebook wants to track me, they have to ask, and I get a chance to say no. If you've been, if you, I was going to say, been tracking that. Um, you know, something like 94% of customers are saying, I don't want to be tracked. What's sort of amazing is that 6% are saying, please track me everywhere, though I assume some of that's just fat fingers and people hitting the wrong button. But when you actually empower people in a meaningful way, we're seeing people actually try to reclaim their privacy. Okay, that's one issue. Second issue is now really the question for Sonia. I want to know what you would do. So do you go GDPR, I'll pass it in Congress tomorrow. Is that what I want to do? California, that's what I want to do. So, so yeah, okay. So what, what do you want to do? So Sonia, let me let you re respond to Randy. Could you start with a few words about what GDPR is for those in the audience who may not know? Sure. Um, okay. So uh, the GDPR is um, basically a regulation that was passed um, uh, through the EU. And um, it was passed uh, uh, over a year ago, and uh, or two years ago, I can't remember. It was just a massive. It, the pandemic has just screwed up my calendaring. Um, but <laughs> um, it seems very recent, but it probably wasn't that recent. Um, but what it basically did was it created. Um, Kate used the word uh, sort of omnibus, and and that's essentially what it did. It created an omnibus of different regulations for companies that were processing. Uh, personal data um, and uh, and and really set up a system uh, where individuals were entitled to a bunch of different kinds of, of protections, um, protections involving um, the uh, the right to erase their data, uh, protections involving uh, greater transparency, uh, regulations involving automated processing of their information. Um, there's a host of other kinds of um, protections, but I think it's safe to say that much of what you see in the GDPR is something that we do not see 
uh, on a regular basis in the United States. Um, and I wanted, I want to actually, um, I'd, I'd actually love to hear from Kate and Randy regarding their interpretations of how they've thought the GDPR has has been has been dealt with, um, and how U.S. companies have have had to kind of ramp up their standards to harmonize with the higher expectations of the GDPR. But the other thing that I also just want to point out. And of course, I'm totally uh, self-biased here because uh, our amazing um, our amazing faculty member Jennifer Urban has just been uh, she's just been named the head of the California Privacy Board. Um, and so uh, I, I got to say, I wish she were here so that we could ask her what her view. Um, she's such uh, a rock star. I know, <laughs> amazing, like the future of privacy would be. But I think that like really thinking about the way that California is dealing with these issues through the lens of thinking about it as consumer protection is a really important framing um, because what it does is it accomplishes much of what I think Randy is talking about in terms of getting consumers to think more aggressively about how important it is to protect their data. We've actually seen this in facial recognition technologies where cities have um, you know, sort of uh, come together to decide that they don't want to adopt facial recognition technologies because of the privacy implications. I do think it is possible for us to educate people about the privacy and data related concerns, but I think what's hard here is without a frame that allows people to think about privacy as a commodity or some way in which they are intrinsically self-interested in being more aggressive in protecting their data. I'm not sure how much traction we'll see at the federal level, although I'm certainly excited to see what happens. Um, I think AI is another area where I think we might see greater privacy regulation as well. Um, I am happy to, to, to jump in. And I just was going to say that, like, I agree with all of that. When I said omnibus privacy, I mean that there is like one type of like overarching legislation that like touches on all areas and like in comparison to the sectoral approach that like, like the United States generally has to privacy, which is like HIPAA based or like COPPA or like, you know, all of these, like, we're going to like protect children and then we're going to protect healthcare and then we're going to protect like video. And like, we're going to like make all of these various like kind of weird, like hanky, like things that don't really fit into a jigsaw puzzle together with each other. Um, and none of which touch on dignity. So let's not even talk about that. And like the EU part of that <laughs> and like, and the other like, dignity is privacy. But I will say that like one of the things that the greatest thing that I think that you've seen come out of the GDPR is the Brussels effect, which is the Anu Branford like idea of you don't have direct regulation come down on like the US, like the US hasn't passed any regulation, but because all of these companies are under the umbrella of like, I don't know, let's say like conservatively one third of their market share is in the EU, uh, like that they are going to pass regulation that meets the EU standards and they're going to make it the standard for everywhere because that's so much easier um, than trying to make different rules for every different place that they operate in. And so you have actually kind of like a mix of like kind of the Brussels effect or the California effect or the Texas textbook effect, whatever you want to call it, um, in this area. And I think that it's actually kind of really damning. I think it's a type of extraterritorial jurisdiction that we're not really like kind of like really really truly understanding i think that basically right now the fact that i have to click through all of these cookies windows every like I, someone was just like kvetching on twitter about this but like honestly like it's just like gar like this isn't us law there's no reason i should have to do this but they am doing this because all of these sites are like abiding by eu law and it's easier for them to abide by that globally than it is to them make a certain exception for me sitting in the united states and my ip address um but there are like but it is a type of extraterritorial jurisdiction it is a type is like it is of what jack goldsmith and tim wu talked about in who controls the internet it is a like the eu coming for your internet 
that China coming for your internet, the United States coming for your internet in the exact same type of way, like using the internet as a tool of power and of brokerage. And I think that that is something that like we cannot underestimate. I wonder if, you know, to bring it back to Sonia's comment to lead off the privacy discussion, if the application of laws outside of home jurisdictions might also lead to the spreading of norms, right? So might we in the United States start thinking about privacy more in a rights framework the way that Europeans do uh, because we're subject, you know, through the application of European laws to multinational tech companies, uh, you know, to those laws. Randy, or Randy did you want to say something? Yep. Well, I, I don't, I, I'll say, oh, I don't know. So that's not very <laughs> interesting. To say. So uh, everything that Sonia and Kate said, actually, I have quite a bit to say, but I, you know, I want to be sensitive to time here. So the, no, Brussels, no, please, go ahead. the Brussels effect strikes me as a loss of US democratic values. That's what I, yes. Talk, yeah. And, and yes. I go, oh, we should be concerned about that. So yes. I, I don't think we should outsource our lawmaking to Brussels casually. That's one. So yes. you asked directly about GDPR. I have a competition policy view on GDPR, which is it makes it harder for new firms to enter, right? And so big firms, because they can afford all this, maybe they're fine with it. And so we want to think about how that changes entry into these markets. And I think that's an issue that's important. And I, what I say in my antitrust class, I say entry is the most important thing that happens in the US economy. So, so important. You need to make it work. Then I want to say one more thing. Uh, in a back in a world in which you could walk into bookstores and buy them physically, I always was concerned because Amazon would not know what book I'm buying. They provide a valuable service to me in saying, Randy, we saw you bought these 10 books. You're going to love this next book. So I, I do want to say that I think what Sonia said about being sensitive to where you want to give information and where you want to keep it, I think that's actually really important. That's such a really Terrific. great point. Well, thank you all uh, for this terrific discussion uh, about privacy. And in many ways, I think this discussion really kind of cuts across the three areas that we've talked about. And I think a lot of it comes down to a word that, again, all three of you have used with some frequency here, um, which is trust, right? At the end of the day, much of the question, what to do about the balance between these different institutions, between you know, large scale you know, private enterprise on the one hand uh, and government on the other, comes down to the question, who do you trust, <laughs> right? Who do you trust more uh, to implement systems of governance that we think might actually achieve socially valuable outcomes? And that question is complicated in different sectors with respect to different kinds of topics and different kinds of regulation, you know, to, to invoke um, Kate's uh, very helpful, you know, de-simplification of the topic uh, that she led off with. Uh, at the start of the debate. So I think now I'd like to open it up to questions from the floor. So if you want to ask a question, um, please use the Q&A function uh, in, the, uh, in the Zoom webinar. Um, and I will begin with a question, uh, which is how do we communicate these kinds of considerations and this kind of critical discussion uh, to policymakers um, and to the population at large? I um, so would like to take that one. <laughs> I, I'm happy to take it. Um, I I think that this is like actually the most um, crucial uh, issue that I think we all face as, as law professors, which is we have access to um, so much information about all the bad stuff that happens with big tech and our students. I think I, I think many of us have probably had this experience where you know throughout class, uh, you know throughout a course you will see your students become more and more concerned about personal data, about privacy, about big tech, about the way in which uh, a very small number of large companies regulate their everyday lives. And it leads them to make different choices about what to say on Twitter and what to put up on Facebook. And I actually feel like as educators, that is one of the most important things that we can be doing is communicating um, uh, you know, these risks to, to students. Beyond that, in terms of getting in front of policymakers, I think by informing the electorate, we can communicate messages to policymakers about how deeply people care about things. Um, 
like privacy and you know curbing different kinds of technologies that are dangerous. But I would say to anyone that is concerned about these kinds of issues, it is time to get educated and it is time to get involved precisely because we have not seen a consumer uprising when it comes to issues of privacy, freedom of speech and antitrust. And actually we're starting to see one um, now, I think because of the range of hearings that have just been held on these kinds of issues. So I think that this is the time actually for people to get involved. And I think the more you realize what's at stake, the more likely it is people are willing to do that. Um, I will just add that I generally don't think that big tech can be trusted, but I'm wary of trusting government either. Uh, and so I, I actually it was like, we created like all of these amendments, to the Constitution, does not anyone remember these like about specifically not trusting government to regulate in this area. Um, but that being said, like, I think that the worst possible thing that can happen out of this entire schema of events right now is that we become so effervescent and so charged to regulate, that we regulate blindly, that we drive big tech into the arms of government, which is already very, very powerful and we have seen in the last four years how powerful it can be especially in the executive branch and there is like a i think that the worst possible thing for end users and citizens is that we drive government and the platforms together and that like they actually are a very wonderful countervailing mechanism for citizens to use against government control and also against like other kinds of like consumer capture and other types of things. So that's just, I mean, that is like, that's what I hope we can reach, but I don't know if that's gonna be possible, but that's my hope. Uh, I guess a couple of thoughts. So, so when Mike said trust, I wrote down relative trust. And I, I think it goes exactly to where Kate just was. Um, we've got these very large actors. As Kate suggested, I think sometimes the fact that these guys are big is good because they can actually invest the resources um, to, to actually try to protect privacy. So there's an example, and Sonia knows this one, I'm sure much better than I do, where there was a terrible mass shooting um, in San Bernardino and there was an iPhone um, and there was information there. Uh, that the FBI wanted to get to. And Apple has the resources to have those serious fights with the government. And, and we cannot assume that something like the Fourth Amendment is going to take care of itself. Someone has to, someone has to take responsibility for it. Uh, and these big firms, because they've got the resources to do that, uh, are able to do that. I don't, I'm sort of, I don't know if Kate said this, I sort of don't trust anybody. I think that goes with the legal, that's what we do as lawyers. We don't I trust think I, I talked around it, but I said- Yeah, we don't trust anybody. <laughs> so, Pretty much. you know, and, and that's okay. It's not fair. I do trust, okay, but, but I'm, I'll I'm trust skeptical, you. right? And, and I, you know, I, I want to make sure that these people are, all of them, government, large firms are being straight with us. I'll stop there. I think it's actually, the, on what Sonia said about education, the original question, I think it's like, and this is what Kate said earlier, it's the best time to be a speaker ever, right? The Google Facebook, the Google complaint is filed. I, I'm in my bedroom standing next to my closet shooting a video that day, and I put it up on YouTube and I can reach 5,000 people pretty quickly. So it's the best time ever to be a speaker. It's really a wonderful time to be an educator. It feels great. It feels very, it feels very fruitful, um, but it is also just like, yeah, I mean, but it is also like a really hard, it is really hard because you say the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again, but. Yeah, I would also just say though, um, like I, I agree with both of you. I think this is a really good time for people to speak out about the civil rights issues that concern them. But I will also say that I don't really think that this is a great time for a lot of people when it comes to social media. I, you know, I, I think that social media has exploded in a world, particularly on Twitter, where, you know, I don't know a single friend, a uh, female identified um, who has not been targeted and harassed and, you know, had really awful things happen to them, concerned about safety, concerned about their freedom of speech. Um, and I just, you know, and I would say that I, you know, as much as we do want to celebrate 
the opportunities of big tech, I, I really do think that, you know, for a number of constituencies, you know, um, this is not a great time for social media. It is, it is unhealthy, uh, to, to put it mildly. Yeah, that's a great point. We have a, a question from the audience that, that touches on, on that unhealthiness. Um, and so the question is, what is your response to the risk that individuals who are forced off regulated platforms seek out alternative platforms that possess a lack of regulation and allow like-minded peers to empower each other with harmful views, especially towards marginalized groups, such as people of color, women, the queer community, uh, and so forth. Um, so this invokes Randy's example from our discussion on antitrust uh, about parlor. Um, so curious for the panel's views on this question. I mean, my my take on this is that like, as far as, well, I don't know, from a US perspective, it doesn't really matter from a US perspective, but like basically like you're, like if there is, the, there is going to be, there are going to be alternative speech platforms on the internet, like until we like run them out of business in some type of way, and then they'll just go to the dark web in some other type of way and like whatever. But like, I, I'm not like, so if the question is just, purely about kind of like going from Facebook to, to parlor, then I mean, those are just kind of like deciding to put your deciding to like, that just decide like, you're going to have less network effects by going to parlor. Um, that's, that, that's going to be the biggest punishment that you that you have for going to parlor, but you're still able to speak, you're still able to talk or to like project your message. I don't know, Randy, what do you think? Randy, I'm afraid you're muted. I, yeah, you I go. know. Thanks. Um, so uh, honestly, I, I think separation and disengagement is like like the biggest issue we have in the society. So so I ran and I don't know who was providing this service. I ran a thing I saw recently. I guess it was the New York Times, where wow, who do you live next to? And where I live, Hyde Park, Chicago, South Side of Chicago. 99% of the people near me are Democrats and, and that's how they vote. And, and the fact that that's a sort of idea bubble that I think I live in concerns me. And, and you create those bubbles when you force people to disperse to their little corners of the internet. I still, and I, I, I've yet to see it happen. I still believe in the power of persuasion, never see it happen in reality, right? But I wanna try to engage with people um, and so if I can't see them, I don't think I can engage with them. Really? Like if you yeah. can't see a person in the face? Well, what I mean by see, I don't mean see, see, but I mean, I, I, although I sort of believe that too, honestly, do, do you think you persuade people on Twitter? I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I, I think there's a certain lack of a sense that there's another person on the other side of this. And I want to see the people, I guess. I do sort of hmm. do that. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't persuade Kate. See, we'll see if I persuade No, Claudia. no, no. I just like, I just like, a lot of my best friends are from the internet. So like, I yeah. just kind of like, <laughs> we're just of two different generations. Like, yeah, well, like, I just like, I mean, like, I just like, I met a bunch of my best friends growing up, like literally from live journal, like, and like, and like these crazy other, like, like, like lambda moo and like all of these yeah. weird little communities and like that's like and we like all found out we we're in the same town and then we like hung out at like 7-eleven together and then we were friends <laughs> so like but i mean but there is the part that you speak of randy which is like uh the part in which we like met each other in person and there was a trust building exercise that happened because of the in-person meeting for sure yeah. for sure there's a, a question from the audience that, that asks quite directly, uh, many platforms are used for spreading misinformation, which threatens our democracy. How do we deal with the threat of misinformation? A nice compact question. So I- gotta be you, Kate. Yeah, please, be no, Kate. no, please, no, please. I've talked a lot. Sonia, please go. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say something that I think um, is a little bit out of left field, but um, I just saw the documentary uh, Into the Storm, 
um, which is about, uh, you know, unmasking QAnon. And, uh, and I have to just say, it was probably one of the most sort of thought provoking um, documentaries I'd seen uh, in recent years. Uh, not because of everybody sort of knows, you know, kind of the current events that happened and surrounded QAnon, but what I was really struck by, and this answers the, it partly answers the question, is the lack of empathy um, around uh, individuals uh, within particular communities. And I say this across the board, left, right, center. I actually believe that the failure of our society to teach at a very young age, things like empathy and compassion and understanding actually wind up creating the effects that we are now seeing where individuals just do not care what they say on the internet. Individuals do not care about the effects that it has. Individuals look at people that are vulnerable and they think of them as targets or opportunities for humor. And that kind of like ironic, apathetic, lack of empathy is all over that documentary. And it is it is the most dispiriting thing. Um, and, and to be honest, I feel like that's the cause. Sonia, thank you for saying that. I think that like empathy is like, basic empathy and like restorative justice are some of the only solutions we have long term towards solving these problems. I think that they are not problems solved or created necessarily by tech companies. They're exacerbated by tech companies and they are human problems and human ways in which we treat each other that we like are very un we're very unhappy at seeing at scale and in full color honestly, that we do this to each other all the time, but we, we do, and to each other's children and to children, like all the, like, it's just terrible. And I completely agree with you. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of this has to come from a, a core, like, like humanity centered change in how we treat each other. So thank you for bringing that up. Why don't we wrap things up with, with one final question from the audience? Uh, which I think, you know, puts a nice bow on this discussion. Um, so the question is, you know, the theme that the panelists have put forward throughout the last, you know, hour and a half uh, is of, you know, trusting neither government nor big tech, right? Or, or trusting the two relative to one another. So is the logical step to that statement not to regulate big tech? Or is the logical step measured regulations on privacy for big tech? and checks and balances on the government. So I think the question amounts to, where do we all actually net out on this? And it's a stumper. I will go first, um, which is that I generally think that when it comes to speech, um, I think that the, the government is particularly dangerous um, in regulating governments generally are particularly dangerous in regulating this. Um, and so uh, if it comes to direct speech, like hate speech regulation or things like that, I tend to come down on the side of like favoring self-regulation by private entities, um, but with more trying to regulate for more transparency and procedure and accountability um, from those com companies, which is to say that something like the oversight board is a model for, which is like, regulating the existence of bodies like that into existence could be a really wonderful moment for these private companies to be accountable in a government-like way. Um, but that's about that's about where that's about where my expertise ends. And then I stop <laughs> being able to feel like I have like a very good sense of how to like regulate. I certainly teach um, in my platforms class um, lots of regulatory failures, and and I and I do that in a in a context where I, what I say in class I say this I say I understand how smart people could have made those decisions, and had I been there, I might have made exactly the same decisions. So um, we could talk about the 1996 Telecommunications Act that way in a number of ways. Um, you know, I have to go back to antitrust. You know the settlement with AT&T in 1956 is, 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 is there's so many, you know, it sort of opens up the patents of AT&T. And I think that was in some sense powerful 
At the same time, it blocks AT&T from computers. So does it create the IBM monopoly in mainframes? I don't know, right? So, so um, nonetheless, if you ask me what I would do, I, I, I still maybe foolishly believe we can do better um, and, and, you know, would take cautious steps forward to try to do that, notwithstanding the fact that I think it's very, very hard. Yeah, so I mean, I, I would say just for the purposes of debate, um, I'm gonna, and also because I am a graduate of the University of Chicago, so I'm gonna offer a different view to Randy uh, and say that like, there are lots of examples where I think we can see that regulation has failed. On the other hand, I also think that, you know, many members of minority groups look at regulation and judicial review as like the only way in which their issues and their interests that represent them can be adequately represented. And I think that um, that forces uh, those of us, you know, who think about vulnerable groups to remember that the market doesn't always act in favor of, of those vulnerable groups. And I'm not saying that that you're not um, thinking about that, Randy. I'm just pointing out that I think that, you know, it is something that that I, I know that I think about. Um, that does not mean, however, that I would wholeheartedly favor regulation, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and grant government a blank check in terms of what it means to regulate big tech. But here's the model that I'm gonna end with. And this is the model that I think is actually somewhat hopeful, which is, um, you know, in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, you had the world of corporate governance became completely revolutionized and in ways that many people have very different views on the utility of this. But the world of compliance developed solely out of a recognition that we could not trust corporations to regulate themselves. And we had to create independent bodies to help uh, corporations behave more responsibly. And that involved, uh, you know, uh, auditing, corporate governance uh, uh, institutions. It involved the institution of whistleblower protections. And every single one of those pathways are pathways that I think we're now seeing some sort of traction with when we think about regulating big tech. And I think that those are opportunities for us to learn from the lessons of history and to be mindful of exactly what both Randy and Kate have pointed out, right? Which is that the market isn't perfect and neither is government. And maybe having opportunities for each one to check the other can be really valuable in this space. And with that, I think we will bring this to a close. So thank you so much, Kate and Randy and Sonia for a terrific debate. I wanna add my thanks in to our panelists and also to you, Mike, for being an incredibly clarifying, synthesizing uh, and synthesizing moderator. Um, I think this was a great debate, which we can see by the fact that we've learned that there are no simple answers to these complex questions. Uh, thanks as well to our Spanish interpreters, Professor Viola Milio and Alini Ferreira. Uh, thank you to our audience for attending. Um, please be sure to fill out the audience survey when you leave the event. And again, um, I'm grateful to you all. Good night. <laughs>